you're dealing in a system of commerce, all of it. There's no law going on here. The courts do not deal in law. The police do not deal in law at all. The government does not deal in law at all. Zero. It is all commerce and it's all based on civil procedure codes, acts and statutes and all this nonsense, okay? <laughs> I'm sending it back, and by the way, that's now costing you 500 quid administration costs. Under the Police and Criminal Evidence yeah, Act. No, that's, yeah. okay. that's, an act. that's an act. So you can serve notice on that police officer. No, to it execute doesn't. this okay. warrant. Well, no, it the way I see it is that no, only about okay. consent. So the government itself is a corporation. Say anything, but it may harm you. You have to answer my question, question something <laughs> which you later are in court. <laughs> How does that actually work in reality? Pete, how are you, sir? I'm good, thanks. How are you? <laughs> oh, mate, I'm absolutely wicked. I'm so pleased to be um, speaking to you, Pete. You, There's nothing but um, good words said about you on the internet these days. Just pick one media company. So you've got the BBC are just starting to come out and say stuff in their broadcast. Like, you got to lock yourself in your house. And then you got to like wear these certain things on your face and, and like everyone went along with it. And during this time, like I didn't receive one single official piece of paper through my door, whether that be from the NHS, a government body, the vast majority of people just seemed to accept what the BBC were telling them. During that time, Pete, I started to be made aware of of the law, mm. which I'd always just thought the law, the law's the law. And then people are starting to say, "Well, no, like our original law comes from." And I might have this wrong, so that's when, fine. When you come in, mate, you're going to correct me. But like things like the Magna Carta. That said, Pete, how how did you get into? you know learn what learning about freedom was this okay. something was this something that triggered you in particular i've always been into it um ever since i was born i think um i always asked questions which got me into trouble <laughs> so i was always getting detention at school because i didn't believe the teacher so there's a lot of stuff the teacher was saying i was going that doesn't make sense and then i would ask questions and embarrass the teacher and then i'd get into trouble the thing with being sovereign, I suppose, let's start with that. Um, a lot of people um, think it's paperwork that makes you sovereign. No, no, it isn't. It is your mindset. Now, most people today have been brainwashed to be slaves. OK, this is indoctrination. Um, this is done through school. OK, so you end up going to school. They break down your creative ideas, if you like. Um, they break down your critical thinking part of the brain, the, the part of the brain that asks questions. That's all destroyed. And you're programmed into being a slave and you're just told to shut up and do as you're told, answer to your name, all this sort of stuff. And then, of course, it's um, you've got the propaganda with movies, uh, TV, newspapers and all the rest of it. And then there's even a chemical part to it as well. So there's um, if you look into the foods that people are eating, it's high in sugars. Uh, sugars damages the brain uh, it speeds up the aging process it also creates mental problems um, there's also e-numbers in food and there's no nutrition in modern day food if you buy it in a supermarket so all of this including with some of the medicines that the state um, healthcare service provides and i use the term medicines very loosely here and i can't go any deeper than that but you put all that into the mix and what you've got is you've got a nation of people that are slaves. They have the slave mentality. They do as they are told, and they believe that authority comes from government, which it doesn't. So what we do at the Sovereign Project is we help people with their mindset first. Okay, If you do not have the correct mindset, you are going to lose this game. Don't think there's some magical piece of paperwork out there that all you've got to do is download it, sign it, send it off, and all my problems go away. doesn't work that way. So mindset is key. You have to break the slave mentality. Now, here's the thing. 
I normally test people to see if they have a slave mentality. I'll ask them, ask them some questions, okay? So one of the questions I'll ask them is, where does authority come from? Okay? Now, if they say government, then I know they're brainwashed. Because authority comes from you. <laughs> you are the author of it. That's where the word authority comes from. Author, authority, okay? I am the author of my authority. It comes from me. That's how it works. So that's the first thing. Another thing is credit ratings. So anyone can play along. You know, you can listen to this. So if I ask you what your credit rating is, and if a number pops into your head, and you're about to tell me a number that your credit rating is this, you're brainwashed. Because <laughs> here's the thing. Did you ask somebody to even give you a credit rating? I don't think you did. And did you also allow this person to sell your data to anybody who wants to buy it? I don't think you did. So that's the slave mentality. So it starts with the mindset, um, and then we can get into the paperwork if you wish. But uh, sovereignty starts with that. And, um, yeah, I've always had that mindset. I, I deal with people. Like, who says I've got to do it? <laughs> Don't deal with legal fictions either. <laughs> people say, oh, the government says you've got to do it. And I go, oh, fucking love of God. No such thing as government. Government exists on paper only. That makes it a legal fiction, okay? Can I shake hands with the government? No, I can't. What does the government look like? You can't describe it. It doesn't exist. It only exists on paper. So if someone says, I have to do the thing, I say, who says? I need a name. I need a name of someone who's alive who says, I have to do the thing or I have to pay the thing. And if that name is not forthcoming, then there's no claim. So we get into that as well, if you wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you 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 fire off some with some great points, Pete. And I I'd say, yeah, you know, I don't know if if, if, um, if you relate to this, but you know, why does authority come within? Well, because we're manifestation of the universe, aren't we? Of of the everything, mm -hmm. the um, you know, the all. Yeah. Reason I reacted to, and I'm not going to. I can't give specifics here, folks, but the, you know, we were being asked to do certain things, weren't we? In the and and it's like it doesn't work like that, you know. I'm I'm a sovereign human being. I'm perfect under the universe, specifically or individually. I like keeping fit. I like eating a majority vegetable based diet so that I'm alkaline, so that I never get ill ever. To go back to your point, yeah sovereign human beings we're manifestation of 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 the universe and that's got to be the first author authority has it not yeah and it's on an individual basis so the thing is is it's all about self ownership okay so basically if you own yourself then you are authority of it if you like i am authority of me so that's where it comes from now if anyone else out there says i don't own myself that's not even a debate. I'm not getting into, into a debate. That's a threat because they're saying I don't know myself. Well, that means that someone else must then. That means I'm a slave and we've got a problem now, don't we? <laughs> so it's about self-ownership. So if I own myself, which I do, then I must be authority everything of everything that I create. So that's, that's another thing uh, we can get into with commerce, if you like. Because um, when you understand, let's get into the law side of things as well. To understand the system, you've got to study the system. When you understand the system and how it works, you will see there is a way out, and the system is so fragile, it's unbelievable. It really is. The entire system is a bluff, all of it. But you have to study it, and you've got to see it. So one of the things, you've probably heard of Klaus Schwab saying you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Okay, I don't know about the happy part, but the, the thing about you'll own nothing is he's right. Because unfortunately, everybody today, they don't own, don't own anything now. So a lot of people think, oh, in 2030, Agenda 2030, they think, oh, the government's going to take our stuff. Well, here's the problem. You've actually already given it away. So your house, your car, your children, your businesses and everything like that, you've already given it away. You don't own any of it, okay? Now, don't panic because the system is not legitimate. Now, one of the things you will learn um, within basic contract law is there, cannot, there can be no fraud. OK, you can't be um, tricked into entering into a contract. All right. There has to be informed consent and because you were never informed of this. The contracts that the government or the people behind government think they have are actually null and void. All of them. 
All right. But you have to study this. You've got to see the, the way out. So we've got to say, OK, then, well, how does everybody how does the uh, the government, which is a corporation, owns everything now? Well, you've handed over um, your property to the government through registration. OK, now the th- the way it works is the average person, unfortunately, is illiterate today. They can't read. All right. They might be able to recognize text on a piece of paper, but they do not understand the meaning behind the words. They are blasé to it. OK, they do not understand legal fictions. They do not understand legal titles and they do not understand the meaning behind words and they do not see the deception. If you register anything with any corporation or government body, you are handing over ownership. That's what you're doing. Now, let's talk about ownership. There's a thing that people don't understand. Again, people are dumbed down. Just because you own something doesn't mean you own it. And you go, what does that mean? That doesn't make any sense. Well, here's the thing. Anything with ship on the end of the word is giving you a clue. Ship is maritime law. Okay. So ship, if you hear the word ship on the end of something, it means there's a third party or there's at least two parties within it. So like friendship. Okay, there's two people. They are now friends, okay? So they're on the friendship. On on that ship, there's a set of rules that they both agree to, okay? Friendship, okay? Mm. Courtship, another one. When you you meet a a, a young lady, when you're growing up, you're a young lad, you meet a young, young lady, there's two of you. You've now boarded the ship of the courtship. There's a rules going on, okay? So ownership, same thing ownership you've boarded the ship of owning something but on that ship of owning something there are things called legal titles and there are rights the average person doesn't understand this so what has happened is when you register anything such as your car the car's the easy one now i mean if you're getting into this common law stuff the car is the easy one to understand you've given your car away because you registered it okay the way it actually works this is how it works you're dealing in a system of commerce, all of it. There's no law going on here. The courts do not deal in law. The police do not deal in law at all. The government does not deal in law at all. Zero. It is all commerce, and it's all based on civil procedure codes, acts and statutes, and all this nonsense, okay? That's what they deal in. It's all commerce. So what's happened is, within commerce, one of their rules is um, you can only control that which you create, All right. That's an important thing to understand. So if I've created something, let's say, for example, I create this cup, I can control it. Okay, it's mine. I have full ownership. Now, full ownership means that I have title to it and I also have all the rights to it as well. I have the whole thing. That's really referred to as a loidial title or sometimes referred to as superior title or even superior deed. I have outright ownership. Okay. So now we understand that. So the way the car works, this is an easy one. What happens, say Ford, they they make a, uh, you know, some sort of car, sports car, Ford Mustang, whatever it is, doesn't really matter. They are the creators of it, which means they control it. Now, once the car is actually made, they also create what is called a manufacturer's statement of origin. This is like a declaration of creation. All right. In the olden days, this was done through affidavit. So when something was created for the first time, some the creator of it, so it was a carpenter, he would create an affidavit of uh, creation, and he would say he's the one who created it, and he would say uh, give a brief description of what it was and on what date it was created, and then this affidavit could then create a deed, and then those pieces of paperwork would be given to the new owner. So let's say I wanted to buy the the um, the chair from the carpenter, you know, several hundred years ago. I say, can I buy that chair? He goes, yes, here you go. Well, if it's to be mine and I have all the rights, all the title to it, I must also get the affidavit. I must also get the deed to it. So he gives me the paperwork as well. And then we sign off a change of title. There's a contract. So we sign it off. The, the creator of the chair is now giving up all title to it. He has no rights, no titles, and nothing at all, and he's given it to the new owner. I now own the chair. I have the paperwork to prove it. I have full control over the chair outright. So going back to the car, manufacturer statement of origin is created when the car is made. Now, that manufacturer statement of origin actually gets sent to the government of your country. By the way, a country is a corporation. It's not the land. 
Okay, it's a corporation. The United States of America is a corporation. UK is a corporation. So this manufacturer statement of origin is sent to the corporation, where what they will do is they take that. that by the way, that document, the manufacturer statement of origin, is actually worth the same value as the car itself. So say the car's worth 50 grand, that document is also worth 50 grand. All right, so there's 100 grand, grand worth of value going on here. Now, the government then creates what is called a certificate of conformity or certificate of manufacturer. Certificate means a copy of. So every time you hear copy you know, certificate, think copy of. It's not the original. And it's also coming from someone else. It's someone else's authority. This is where we've got to get into the words again. If you are awarded a certificate from someone else, okay, award, the word ward means you've given up your authority. Your authority is not involved here. It's someone else's authority. So you're awarded. So you're awarded a certificate from someone else. It's from their authority. So you've now got a certificate of conformity from the government. That goes to the uh, the car dealer. So the car, the car dealer now has a certificate of conformity. You go and buy the brand new car from the Ford dealership, for example. You give them the £50,000 to buy the car. And then the um, the dealer says, would you like us to register the car? And, of course, the average person, because they have no clue what they're doing, they do not understand legal terms at all. They say, okay. So they go, okay, register the car. Register means handing over ownership. So then that certificate of conformity or certificate of manufacture is then sent to the transport department of that country. In, in the UK, that would be DVLA. So DVLA then gets that certificate of conformity. Okay, so they get that. They own it. It's point of trust. So they now have control over the car. They own the car, in quotes. You get a document back, which is called a logbook, and it will refer to you as the registered keeper. That's it. All you have left is the right to use it under certain conditions. That's all you have left. You don't own it. It's not yours. It's not your property. You don't have title to it at all. You just have use of it. And then what happens is, is you are granted a license plate. Remember, license means asking permission. Again, the average person has no clue. They don't, they, they're blasé to these words. So the car is officially government property now because you've registered it with a government agent, which is the DVLA. They then give you a license plate. Okay. So the license plate means you are now allowed to use government property under license. That's what it is. And that you have, there's a government number on that property, which is owned by the government now. Now, here's the thing. The government turns around and says, well, that's ours now. Well, if you want to use it, you need what is called a driver's license. So then you're going to go and do a test. You're now going to get a driver's license because you need permission to drive government property, which is under license, it's got a license plate on it. And then the government says, well, you're using our property. You're going to have to pay tax on that. So then you've got to pay your road tax and the tax on the fuel and all the rest of the nonsense that goes along with it. Then they'll say, well, we need to inspect our government property once a year. And in the UK, that's called an MOT. So then you submit your government property once a year to the government for inspection, which is a tax inspection, by the way. And what you're doing is you're entering into another contract where you're allowing the government to, to tax you again the following year. That's why it's renewed every 12 months. The contract's renewed. So, and also now what you've done, because it's government property and it's under the control of the DVLA, you've agreed to the highway code. So now you are bound by all the speeding laws. And I use the word laws in very loose uh, air quotes here. They're not laws at all. They are corporate policies. But you've agreed. So now all the double yellow lines and all the road markings and all that now apply to that government property that you've given to the government and you're driving under license as a driver in commerce. And here's the thing. You've probably heard of you, Les. That's very unpopular at the minute. Well, unfortunately, you've accepted it. What have you done? You've registered the car. You've given it to DVLA. And the government's saying, okay, well, it's our property then. And we've just come up with this new corporate policy called you, Les, and you've got to follow it. So the way out of this, there is a way out. As long as you understand it's all commerce and you're dealing with corporations there's no such thing as government don't get that out of your brain okay you're dealing with corporations all of it the who the you know all of them wef all of it doesn't matter international monetary fund they are all 
corporations, no different than McDonald's, including the police, by the way. The police are for-profit, private corporations. That's what they are. And all they do is basically trick you into entering into a contract for money. That's all they are doing. Okay, The police have no authority. This is brain, brain, uh, brain uh, uh, slave mentality. So this is mental state. You only believe they have authority. But when you know where authority comes from, and you go, well, hang on a minute, I didn't give any authority to the police to tell me what to do. So remember, the police do not deal in law, they deal in corporate policy. That's why they're called policy officers. That's where the name comes from. Okay. So there is a way out. As long as you understand it is all commerce. And by the way, one of the laws in their system, by the way, in commerce, is there is no involuntary servitude. What does that mean? It means you cannot be forced into becoming a slave. You have to volunteer. And that's what everybody's done. That's why everyone feels like a slave. Well, yes, you've volunteered. You've registered your children, which means you've, gave, you've given, given your children away. And then you take them to a school and you register again. And now you've got no rights of that child whatsoever. You've given them all away. All right? The school now owns them. And social services can get involved now because that's now uh, government property. That child is government property now. So this is how the people within the system operate, the, the parasite class, these bureaucrats. They feel like um, as long as you consent by not speaking up or by signing documents, as long as you sign a document, you agree to it, that's it. It doesn't matter that you don't know any different. In fact, one of their, um, one of their maxims is um, for... For he who wishes to be deceived, let him. That's in their system. So if you are stupid enough to be deceived, that's your fault. That's how these bureaucrats operate. So if you don't do the research, you don't look into this, and you f fill out all the forms and all the rest of it, that's your fault. If you register to vote, well, that's your fault. By the way, if you register to vote, you've given up power of attorney. So this is, the, and your vote is meaningless. It has no meaning whatsoever, Okay. And you've also agreed to become the debtor of the state if you registered to vote. So going back to the solutions, uh, another another thing within their, um, their system in, in commerce is everybody has the right to terminate a contract. Now, this is very big. Everyone listening, you've got to learn this. You have the right to terminate any contract, any. What's the biggest contract that most people get into in their lives? getting married that's that's the biggest one okay there is no real bigger contract than that i don't think okay but you can terminate that contract it's called a divorce so you can terminate that so if you can terminate a marriage contract you can terminate terminate any which means that you registered your car with dvla you can unregister it you can say you know what i'd like my property back thank you very much i don't want to register it with you anymore now if you are able to do that i'm not saying it's easy and I don't say people listening to this, it's just a magic form. You fill out this magic form and it's just done overnight. No. The people within the system are going to fight you because they're going to lose power if enough people wake up to this. But if there's enough of us and we all say, you know what, I want my car back. All right? I don't want a license plate on it anymore. I don't want a driver's license anymore. I don't want to be paying tax on it anymore. Thank you very much. Go away. I want my car back. It's mine. I have a loyal title on it. I own it outright. As soon as that car is yours outright, then nothing applies to you to do with the government. The police have no power to even pull you over. They can't do it. They can't touch that car. Parking tickets no, no, no longer apply. You can't apply a ticket to it. You can't apply a speeding ticket to it. Bailiffs can't touch it because it's a violation of your rights. ULES no longer applies. 15-minute cities no longer apply to that car. You can't use CCTV on that car. Because you're violating my rights, because I didn't give you permission. This is how powerful this stuff is, people. You have to wake up. You've got to understand it is all commerce. You've got to stand your ground. You've got, you've got to become sovereign. You've got to get a little bit angry, <laughs> but you just stand your ground and say, I'm not putting up with this anymore. Don't deal with legal fictions. Deal with named people. If you're getting letters in the post um, that does not have a signature on it, saying you've got to pay a ticket, you've got to pay this, you've got to pay that, then straight away alarm bell should ring because you will know that's fraudulent. Because if there's no signature on it with a name, 
then how do I know who sent it? Who, who sent it to me? If I don't know who sent me that document, how do I even know that I'm obligated with the person who sent it? I don't. So this should give you a clue. Here's the thing. If you are dealing with the government and you they send you a form, right, and they ask you to sign the form, what happens if you don't sign it and you send it back to you send it to them? They send it back, don't they? They say, sorry, we can't process this because there's no signature on it. You didn't sign it. Okay. Well, we can do the same. So if anything from government departments comes through our letterbox and there's no signature on it, we can say exactly the same thing. Sorry, I can't process this. There's no signature on it. Send it back with a fee. So you'd send an administration fee. You go, well, you've sent me a document. I can't deal with it. There's no signature on it. I don't know who sent it, so I can't go any further. I'm sending it back. And by the way, that's now costing you 500 quid administration costs because you have the right to charge for your time and labor. So people are starting to wake up to this, right? It's all commerce-based. As long as you understand that, you can start dealing with the situation, okay? And this is what we do with the Sovereign Project. We start helping people with their mindset. We get rid of the slave mentality first. Once you get rid of that slave mentality, you actually become sovereign and you stand your ground. You don't ask permission, okay? I hear it all the time. People say, oh, are we allowed to do this? Oh, for the love of God. No such thing as we, for example. There's no we going on. <laughs> and also, if you're asking yourself if you're allowed to do it, who are you asking? That's that's your, that's the brainwashing coming in there. You see how that works. It's like people are, am I allowed to do it? Who are you asking? <laughs> You've got to break that. As long as you're not going to cause any harm and you're not violating a prior, a prior agreement, then yes, you can do the thing. If you're not allowed to do something, you've got to ask this question again. Who's stopping you? There's only people on this planet. Government doesn't exist. So who is it who's saying you can't do the thing? But here's another thing. Let's say if you want to do an, an extension on your home, at how, your house, you've got a property, right? And you want to put a, I don't know, extension on it. You want to build a garage on the side of it. Why are you asking permission to do that? Who are you asking permission from to do it? If you have to ask permission from a higher authority, then that means you don't own your house, doesn't it? If it was your house, you owned it, you could just build. So, yeah, we can go more into, uh, oh, should we touch on law versus legal? That can I just, help. Pete, I just want to um, clarify something here because I reckon yeah. people at home will be wanting me to ask this. So going back to the example of the car, yes, which all makes per perfect sense, by the way, how does that actually work in reality? Um, right. You know, I mean, silly example. Does does any highway patrolman give a damn that you may or may not have registered your car yeah. when, when you've just gone by him at, you know, 140 miles an hour? Correct. Now, the police um, have no clue what they're doing. Okay, the bobby on the beat, if you like, the... The the, the 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 police officer in the panda car no matter what country they are dumbed down as well they are plebs all right um they are not told any of this which is good <laughs> don't panic you've got to look at the good side of things so if you literally have a lordial title of that car a police officer can still pull you over and he can still ignore your paperwork and say no 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 we're going to impound it and all the rest of it and leave you at the side of the road and take your car here's the thing Paperwork will never stop criminals acting criminally, all right? Say there's a serial killer out there killing people. You can't pass some law saying, oh, uh, oh ser serial killing, no, you're not allowed to do that, we've banned it now, and then the serial killer's going to go, oh, whoa, whoa, okay, then now it's illegal for me to be a serial killer, I'm going to stop. Fair enough. Not how it works. So paperwork and laws, if you like, legislation, can never stop criminals acting criminally so people have got to get away from that okay so there's too many people hiding behind paperwork so they get some magic paperwork and they go oh i've got this paperwork now they'll hold it up well, i've got this paperwork and they go you can't touch me because of this paperwork now mr police officer and the police officer is going to go and he's going to take your car so people have got to wake up to that but here's the thing if you've got your paperwork correct you can now go after him. 
So you can serve notice on that police officer in the private. And you say, what you've just done is you've committed a crime against me. You've stolen my property. You have violated my right to travel. And it's going to cost you £250,000 or your house. And then you take his house. Now, this isn't a theory. Someone's already done this. There's a Texas man who did exactly the same thing. Okay, so he does not drive around with a license plate. Okay, he got his paperwork in order. He was stopped by a police uh, police officer, and they impounded his car. So he just carried on. He says, right, well, you violated my rights. I did notify the officer. I said, look, there you go. Here's my paperwork. It's proof. The officer decided to ignore it. So he served a lien on the police station. Remember, police station's a corporation. It's just like so in any other corporation. So he served a lien on that, and uh, he got $250,000 and his car back. Thank you very much. You went out and bought a Porsche 911. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, it might be, um, you know, you might be in this situation. It might be unpleasant. You know, you might get pulled over. Yes, they might take your car. Yes, they might impound it. Yes, you might struggle to get home. You're going to get a taxi and you've got to deal with it. But ultimately, if your paperwork is correct, then you're in the right. And because it's all commerce based, remember, it's all commerce based. The person with the strongest paperwork wins in these courts of commerce. So as long as you've got everything correctly done, you've won, and then you end up getting paid out. So it's like um, people are waking up about bailiffs now because we're realizing that bailiffs do not use correct paperwork. They're bluffing it. They're using fraudulent paperwork. They're using warrants that aren't signed by magistrates and all this. I mean, here in this country, um, in the UK, for those um, watching overseas, uh, in this country, this corporate country, um, there is something called a council tax. Now, the thing with the council tax is the council is a private for-profit corporation. It's the same as McDonald's. It's no different than McDonald's, Burger King, Tesla, I, you know, Apple, whatever. It's the same. They're, you know, they've all got uh, Dunn's numbers and they've got company numbers and all this. So, in fact, I've got the uh, company number here on my, on my uh, computer for the Government UK Limited. So the company number of U uh, Government UK Limited is 5522373. There you go. Go and look it up. So the government itself is a corporation. Parliament, by the way, is a corporation, private for-profit corporation. MPs have got no contract with you. You just assume they do, but they don't. Okay, they're private. They, they have nothing to do with the people. Um, but anyway, going back to uh, council tax, yeah, uh, they have no authority to charge you whatsoever. So there's no obligation to pay. Now you know it's all commerce. What you would do with a council tax is say, well, hang on a minute. Um, am I even obligated? Now, this is how a bill works. Again, people don't understand this. For there to be a true bill, there has to be acceptance of contract first. Okay? So this means that, I, for example, I would have to go into a restaurant. So I'm opening the door of the restaurant. I'm walking in. So I'm beginning to accept the contract of the restaurant. I would sit down. I would place an order. There you go. I've just placed an order. Okay? Now, if the service is to my liking and I accept and finalize the contract, and, and the manager comes up and says, is everything okay th with, with the meal and the service? And I say, yes, lovely steak, whatever, fan fantastic. I've now contracted. Now the restaurant can give me the bill. That's how it works. Well, when the council send out a bill, um, where's my uh, my acceptance? Where's my offer? Where's wh wh Hang on a minute. They have to offer you first. So the council is supposed to say to you, um, would you like to contract with us and uh, pay us £2,000 a year? And you say, no, no, thanks. I don't want that service. And then there's nothing that the council can actually do. So what's happening is, is because the council are acting so fraudulently uh, with this council tax stuff, um, and they're using bogus paperwork, they're using fraudulent documents, um, even the court system won't deal with them the council that's how bad it's getting so when you deal with the council and they say you're summoned to court it's not the court system the council themselves hire out a room and they do a fake court they just hire employees to act like they're a judge it's completely bogus now here's the thing you can you can prove this let's say you get one of these fake summons from the from the council tax and they say right you've not paid and it says summoned and blah 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 there'll be a case number on there okay i mean first of all you'll read it and go hang on a minute is that there's no seal from the court there's no signature from the magistrate i don't even know the name of the magistrate so straight away i know it's a bogus document 
But I go, okay, what have I got here? Well, there's a case number. Okay, phone up the court. If you phone the court up, you quote the case number. The court is supposed to tell you all the details pertaining to the case. So that is the magistrate, who signed off on it, who is the one making the claim, who's it against, dates, or who filed it, all this. All this information should be given to you. You have that right. But you phone the courts up and they'll tell you, sorry, we've got no record of that case number. Excuse me? I'm receiving threats of summonings to court with a case number on it, but the court themselves says they have no record of it. That's seven years imprisonment. You can't do that. People in the council are committing fraud. Now, I don't think that the people low down in the council realize this because they're plebs, right? They've been dumbed down. They're just following orders, but they are the ones committing the crime. So what do you do? You go after the people within that council tax department and say, look, employees within that council tax department are committing fraud. They're sending out bogus summons with fake case numbers on it. When enough people wake up to this, don't fear. You get together. Here's the thing. Get together with people in your area. There's got to be people who are struggling with the council tax. Electricity's gone up, gas has gone up, food's gone up, all petrol's gone up, all the rest of it. They can't cope, right? Get connected in your local area. Get meet up once a week. Find a venue, meet up, meet up once a week, and start getting this information together. Start drafting your own paperwork, and then start serving the people who work for the council notice. That's how you do it. On a personal level, you do not serve notice on the legal fiction corporation, but on the employees themselves and say, you are committing crimes. Here's the evidence. I've gone and look it up. You can look it up. Action statutes, even in the action statutes, it will tell you that a summons must be signed by a judge. It's got to be a judge and a magistrate has to sign off on it. Otherwise, it's bogus. So when bailiffs come knocking on your door with a with a phone, <laughs> say, we've got a warrant here. <laughs> What? No. Give me the paperwork. Give me it's mine. All right. So if someone says they've got a warrant, give it to me. And I can then verify it. And I can say, right, give me the I want to see there's a seal from the court. Is it signed by a magistrate? Who signed off on it? Who is the person who's making the claim against me? I need to know that person's name. I don't deal with legal fictions. They won't. But if they start waving phones at you, say we've got a warrant here, you know immediately that's fraudulent. Because it's a photograph. Photographs are secondary uh, evidence in courts. A photograph on its own is worthless unless there's someone who wants to be witness to it. This is the same with the speeding tickets or any of these uh, traffic tickets. You might get a traffic ticket and there's a photograph of your static car. That's all you get. You get a photograph. You go, well, that's nothing. That's a photograph. You know, it could be photoshopped, right? I need to know the name of the person who's going to swear who's the witness to the photograph. And if there isn't, then the photograph is worthless. It's got no value. It's hearsay. Okay? We all know this. So um, another thing with speeding tickets is like um, we now know there's, what, 1.4 million cloned vehicles on the roads today. 1.4. Cloned means they've stolen someone else's number plate. So if you get a speeding ticket through the post, and it's normally sometimes you don't even get a photograph. You just get uh, uh, one sheet of A4 saying... We are going to notification of a possible conviction or whatever. No signature on it. And it's just saying, tell us who the driver was. And I go, I can't even act on this. I, I need evidence. Give me some documentation. Give me some video evidence. I'll need evidence, please. So I can even verify if it was my car to begin with. And by the way, car, when you've got a car, there's three parties uh, that deal with a car. You have the owner. You've got the driver. And you've got the registered keeper. They're not all the same people. The owner is DVLA. The registered keeper is just the registered keeper. Doesn't mean they're the driver. Driver can be a completely different person. So when you start learning this stuff, you can treat it like commerce. So what you're supposed to do, if you receive any of these documents through the post, you've got to pay a ticket, blah, 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 whatever it is. My suggestion is deal with it and do a reply. And say, right, well, I'd like to try and deal with this. Um, you know, I've just received this in the post. Um, fortunately, um, I can't process what I've received because it's lacking information. First of all, there's no signature. I don't know who sent it. Also, could you please clarify what language you are using and what dictionary are you using? Because the documents that come in the post do not use English. 
and they do not use Oxford English Dictionary either. They are using Black's Law Dictionary. That's one of the dictionaries they can use. There's several different law di dictionaries out there. So you put the burden of proof on them and say, look, before I can go any further, please tell me the name of the, the, name of the language you're using and what dictionary are you using and what style are you using? Style means font. See, again, with the documents they send you, if they change the style of the font on the documentation, that has a meaning. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff in there. So if you see italic writing on some of these documents, that means that the writing's slanted. Well, that means it's not part of the document. It is off the document. Okay, the reason being is this is used by judges. So say, for example, a judge would get an original document in court and he reads it and he would like to make a note on that original document, which he can do. Well, he writes it in a different style. And he does it a slanted writing. That means that if someone else then reads it later on, a few, couple of years later, they can tell that that slanted writing was done by the judge and it's not part of the original document. So people within the government use that dirty trick on you and, they, and you just read it. Also, if anything, it's all caps. Well, if you're using English, the, grammatic, uh, the grammatic rules of English means, okay, if you're using English, everything that's written in all caps is an acronym. So if they say summoned to court, this is another way they get away with it. So if you get a document in the post and it says summoned to court and it's written in all caps, it doesn't say summoned to court. It's an acronym, which means the S means something, the U means something, the M means something. So you could go back and say, can you clarify this, please? I would like to deal with your request. I've, you haven't sent me enough information. I can't deal with this. I need to know what language we're dealing with. I need to know what dictionary you're dealing with. What is the style? What is the syntax? Who sent it to me? I need the name of the person making the claim, full name, full contact information, and I need a signature before I can even move any further. And by the way, my administration cost for doing this work is £500. <laughs> I'm telling you, if people wake up to this, you can fight this in the comfort of your own home with your own paperwork. And if you get hundreds of thousands, millions of people all over the country learning this, just dealing, you know, sending their own paperwork back. This nightmare comes to an end. <laughs> what about um, the the old chestnut? The uh, these parking fines. Um, for me, it's just a case return to sender. Sorry, never contracted with you. Um, right. Bit random that you think that I'm just going to send you sixty pounds, which then gets raised to a hundred and. 20 that's then yes. the next letter is it's 100 um and like i said i've only ha ever had one raised to what you'd call court level right i don't know the validity of that court but i sought advice from the online solicitor which i paid five pounds for said yes it is a recognizable court you do have to reply so my reply was quite simple sorry i've never contracted with these individuals okay. um so can you tell us a bit about a bit about this, Pete? Right. Yes. Now, um, let's very briefly touch on law versus legal, because you've got to understand this before we can move forward. Right. Law is something beyond your reach. It cannot be changed. OK, so like the law of gravity, for example, the law of maths, the law of economics, these are beyond your reach. That's why it's called a law. It cannot be changed. This is how the government operates. They know they can't change law. So what they do is they they have created what is called a legal system. That's something they can change. Okay. Now, legal means contract. All right. I want everyone to understand that. Whenever you hear the word legal or illegal, that is always referring to a contract. In other words, if you've parked somewhere where you shouldn't, then you've entered into a contract, okay, and it is illegal for you to park there without paying, therefore you have to pay, okay? So legal and illegal is always, always, always referring to a contract. It's referring to a policy within a contract. So that's, that's the area that you tackle. So you are correct. You should challenge the contract. You go, well, hang, hang on a minute. If you're saying I've done something illegal... Where's the contract? Now, when you start getting into things like that, parking tickets, there's different layers of parking ticket. Depends if it's private, depends if it's on a public road, okay? By the way, the word public, if people don't know, that actually means private, but it just means state private, okay? So anything public, you do not want to be a member of the public. 
If you're a member of the public, what you're saying is you are operating in, within a private jurisdiction, which is operating as a PMA, which is controlled by someone else. It's, it's a legal title. So people think public means like common to all. No, it's a legal title. So you've got to be careful of using the term public roads. Because if you use the word public road, you're actually saying it's actually a private road. Now, private versus public roads. I'm using air quotes if uh, you're not got, if, for those just listening. So parking ticket. Yeah. So let's say if you technically park on someone's private land without permission, technically that's trespass. OK, but it has to be known to you that you are indeed on someone's private property. OK, for example, if someone parked on your driveway, you would be rather angry and says, I didn't give you permission to park on my driveway. That's my private property. And you would be well within your rights to seize the car and issue a penalty. OK, that's not a problem. But it's when it gets into this legal entrapment world of parking tickets. All right. By the way, parking tickets on the public road like double yellow lines, for example, that's a different form, okay? So double yellow lines, that only applies because what have you done? You've you've registered your car. It's now operating under the rules of DVLA. And under DVLA, they say double yellow lines means no parking. There's the contract. So if you park on double yellow lines, you're supposed to pay. Although there's still ways of getting out of that as well because you've got to say, well, who's issuing the ticket? Do I actually have a contract with them? I technically only have a contract with the DVLA, not council. What are they getting involved for? I don't have a um, I don't have a contract with the police either. So why are they getting involved for? But that's another story. So parking tickets. Now, if these people are issuing parking tickets, now here's the thing: they can't fine you. All right. So let's say you park on private land by mistake. Okay. And even if you do it on purpose, okay, and there's a sign and it says three pound an hour, and you park there for an hour, then. All that that person can claim, the one who owns the, the private land, all that they can claim is the three pound because that's what you owe. OK, now, if there is a notice on the wall and you and it's got to be visible, you, they can't hide it behind a dustbin or something or cover it up with moss or something like that. It's got to be visible. And um, so it's, if it's visible and it's obvious that it is visible, then you are contracting. If you can see the sign and it says you should pay three pound an hour, you are contracting if you do drive onto the land. OK, so if you drive off, then technically you've accepted the contract, but you've not paid the three pound. So when a parking ticket company gets in contact with you, they can't fine you. All they can do is say, look, we've noticed um, that you parked on our land. You've parked there for one hour. Uh, the fee is three pound um we're giving you um 30 days notice can you uh submit the three pound that you owe us so all they can do is actually ask for the amount of the three pound they cannot fine you this is where these parking companies are going wrong because if you don't pay the three pound then what they will do is they have to give you the three letter process so they have to warn you again so this is by the way we can use this as well so you know, when you know how it works, you can use this system against them. So they have to notify you at least three times of the three pound that, you know, that you owe. After that, then they can actually take it to court and they can go into the uh, like a lien and all that sort of process if they wish. But it is the court that issues the fine, not the parking company. So because the parking company are issuing fines, well, they're acting as a court and they can't do that. By the way, the word fine, it, it tells you, it's the word fine is telling you that you are dealing with a contract because that's where fines live. They operate in um, contracts, okay? So you've breached the contract, a, fi a fine is now uh, due. As long as the court says yes, then the fine is issued, okay? In law, there is no fines. You pay damages, that's the difference. So whenever you receive a fine, okay, then that gives you a clue immediately. He says, well, hang on a minute. Where's the contract before you can start dishing out fines? So you can go after the parking ticket company for that. Um, but yes, now, try and avoid statements. When you're dealing with somebody, turn it into questions. So instead of making a statement saying, I don't have a contract with that person, because what you've done, if you make a if you make a statement, you're putting the burden of proof on yourself because you've just made a statement. You now have to prove it. So if you turn around and say, "I don't have a 
contract with this person, I'll say, well, prove you don't. That's be, that's uh, that's the weak. You're on the back foot. So you flip it. So you turn around and say to the parking company, um, I need proof of contract. You've turned it into a question. You're requesting it. So you're saying, okay, can you please provide me with the contract? Now, on the notice itself, right, there's got to be that's the contract. So what does it say on there? Okay. So that's the limitations of what they've they've stipulated. So it is a difficult one. Um, now, let's get into defaults. On a lot of times, um, this is how the parking ticket scam actually operates. Often, the thing that initiates the claim isn't important. The parking ticket itself is not important. So normally what the parking ticket company are trying to do is to create a default. And then they can base the case on the default. Okay. Now we can use this as well ourselves. This is very powerful stuff because you can do this against utility companies. You can serve a utility company a notice. So you can you can serve a, a notice on a utility company and say, look, um, can you please pr provide evidence that you do indeed uh, produce electricity and do indeed provide electricity, please, and you do not receive any other further payment? And can you please provide me evidence that you are not a credit broker and what you are actually doing is trying to sell me debt instead of sending uh, selling me electricity, right? Burden of proof is on them. Now, if they ignore the notice... They're now in default of that notice, aren't they? So that you can build a case on that. So you'll send another notice and say, look, I gave you 30 days notice. You haven't responded. I'm giving you another chance, 14 days. Can you please respond to my uh, questions? I need to know point by point. I need to know all these questions. And then finally, if they ignore that, now you can send them a notice of default. That's the third letter, notice of default. So that utility company is now a uh, notice of default. Now you can build your case on that. So this is how parking tickets operate and clampers and all the rest of it. They want you to n ignore. But here's another thing. <laughs> if the parking ticket company um, is making a claim that they did indeed contact you, burden of proof is on them. They have to prove it. Okay. So a lot of these corporations, because they're acting um, criminally, um, they do not want to use Royal Mail, okay? Because that would that would prove, uh, or in other words, it would be the crime they commit would be uh, registered. Now, let me explain. You will notice that just about every document that is sent to you is in a windowed envelope, okay? And you'll probably also notice that the document that is sent to you is through a, ha the envelope has been franked. So there's, just a, a stamp on that. It's not a Royal Mail stamp. It's been franked. Well, that is actually doing is that is basically internal corporate mail. Okay. And what it's done is it's bypassed the Royal Mail office. Now, Royal Mail has two layers to it. You've got the Royal Mail office and then you've got the Royal Mail service. They're separate. Royal Mail office or post office is in fact a court. It's the biggest one there is. Within the legal system, the highest court there ever is, even above the Supreme Court, is Royal Mail Office. Nothing is higher than that. And it's a postal union that runs that, which is global. It's in every country, okay? Now, now we know that. If anything comes through your letterbox and it's in a windowed envelope, the reason why it's windowed is because this is the way it works. If you write anything on the envelope itself, so you've got a sealed envelope, okay, no window, and you write name and address, all caps name and all the rest of it, okay, and you send it through the Royal Mail office and they put the Royal stamp on it, boom, that is recorded in court. That envelope is now evidence and it's proof that it was sent and it's proof that the all caps name and all the rest of it is. Envelopes are almost as important as the document inside. So don't write on your envelopes, people. Don't do your shopping list on envelopes. Keep them, because as long as it's gone through the Royal Mail office, that's that's evidence you can use. We know that now. So when I send a notice to somebody, I always use Royal Mail office, and I will send it registered mail, always. That's absolute proof, and I'll use a sealed envelope as well, 
so that the address is now on the outside. Everything on the outside of the envelope is in the jurisdiction of the Royal Mail Office. The document inside is not, because clearly that's private. That's got nothing to do with the Royal Mail Office, all right? But the envelope is. So I do sealed envelopes, registered mail, do Royal Mail Office, okay? That is proof they received it. So they can't say, oh, we never got it. No, you did. So if the parking ticket company... If they sent you stuff in the post, they've got a you've got a problem on their hands. They've got no proof they sent it, especially if they sent it through a windowed envelope and it's franked. So a burden of proof is on them. So if they're saying they're trying to make a case against you, you say, well, hang on a minute, I'm going to need proof you even tried to contact me. They can't just say, oh, we sent you, and you know, they can say in the court, well, we sent you a letter on this date. Okay, prove it then. They can't. <laughs> so they've got nothing to provide. So then their case collapses because if they can't prove they tried to contact you, then they can't create a default. And if they can't create a default, then their entire case is based on nothing. This is why we use um, Royal Mail Office. No, by the way, windowed envelopes. Let me just touch on that. The reason why it's windowed envelopes is because, because they can then put your all caps name and address on the document inside the envelope which is not in the jurisdiction of the royal mail office right but because they've provided a window you can look into the envelope and decide whether or not you want to open it so in the eyes of these bureaucrats they don't think they're committing fraud because it's not written on the outside of the envelope but you can even send that back so if you even get a windowed envelope you can send that back because you say the mail is compromised because anybody can look into the window. The, the postman can look in. Anyone could look through the window. That means the mail inside is compromised. I have to return it because it's windowed. See, again, if people woke up to that, then this windowed envelope scam would end. Then all these corporations would then have to write on the outside of the envelope. And then they've got proof. There you go. You wrote it on the outside of the envelope. And you can even, if it's franked, you say, no, I don't want that. Send it Royal Mail. <laughs> when you know how this works, I'm telling you. <laughs> hey, how did you, how, how did you learn all this stuff? Oh, wow. It's not a Google search. Um, this is years and years of me just picking bits and bobs. Um, I started researching when I first had access to the internet, when the internet became available to us all, which was in 1992, I believe. Well, that's when I got into it. I managed to get me, you know, first 56K modem, remember that? And we got our little computers and it took about 30 minutes for a picture to scroll, you know, loading a picture. <laughs> oh, look, I've got, you know, um, but that was it. Uh, once I had access to the internet, that was it. I was started researching. It was a, it's a fantastic tool. And you just go off and you can dig, dig, dig. Now, a lot of the stuff I know today was almost like accidentally found in, if you like, and wasn't searching for it. Um, it it's like you, you search for something else and then you bump into something else and you go, it's like, um, for example, I was researching man-made global warming, which is a total fraud and scam um, years and years and years ago. And I was doing that. And then I, it, it led me onto fiat currency. And I, I go, what the hell is this fiat currency? I never heard of this. So I thought, I better learn what this fiat currency is. And I went, oh, my. Yeah. And that's when I discovered, you know, promissory notes. And we were using uh, money. With, well, it's not money. It's a, it's a pretty promissory note. And I went, oh, my God. And then I started learning about all this. And you just go off in different directions. And it's just like this rabbit hole. But a lot of the things I, I, I research is normally when, when something goes wrong in your life, you've got an issue, you've got a problem. So then you go, okay, I better find some information. I've got to tackle, tackle this. So I'd go off and I would then say, well, okay, well, how do I even write a notice? Okay, let's teach myself. So I'll go online and how do I lay a notice out? And that's how you learn. You just you just pick it up as you go along and you just end up, you know, after 30 years of research and you end up with a lot of knowledge. And now I just condense it all down into easy to read handouts and you can have it for free on my um, website. <laughs> and Pete, can you... Can you give us any examples of where this has worked for you? Because it's yeah. it it all sounds wonderful in in theory. Takes yep. a bit of balls, obviously. It does. Um, but but does it work? Yes, ninety percent of the time it works. Um, there's no such thing as a perfect remedy. By the way, there's no such thing as a answer or a solution. 
All right, there's too many people looking for, um, like I say, magic paperwork. You know, just download this, sign it, and problems go away. No, no, no. We t it's, it's remedy. Now, here's the thing. Two people can do the exactly the same remedy, even on the same government department, and even on the same person within that government department, and you'll get different results. So it doesn't mean that the remedy isn't good. So a lot of people... This is where people fall um, or give up too soon. So what they'll do is they'll try a remedy and then it won't work the first time around. They'll do one notice, for example. They'll send a notice off and they'll get a response they don't like and, oh, that didn't work. And people give in. And you go, no, there's nothing wrong with your remedy. You've got to keep at it. So remedy can take several months. Some of the remedies I've dealt with in my life is over a year long. Keep battling. You know, now in my time... Um, I've dealt with um, a lot of companies that um, haven't honoured uh, warranties, for example. You know, says we're not going to warrant, you know, the warranty, uh, um, you know, so I bought something, it broke, they didn't want to honour the warranty. I bought cars where the dealers did not want to honour the warranty, so I took them to court. Um, so I've won those. Um, I have received a couple of uh, parking tickets in my time. I've managed to get rid of those. Um Takes several times, several several notices. I've got rid of one speeding ticket I got, and that was a double whammy. That was nasty because it was not only was it a speeding ticket, it was fake one as well. So you got to. <clears throat> By the way, a lot of people don't understand this, but the the police uh, allegedly send out bogus um, speeding tickets and just hope people pay it. All right. Uh, so I got caught in one of those, and that was really nasty. Uh, that that took several months to get rid of, but in the end, it was retracted. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's all sorts of stuff. I mean, don't just think about uh, it's anything. It, it can be um, any corporation you're dealing with. It doesn't mean it doesn't have to be government. It doesn't have to be the big stuff. It doesn't have to be income tax. It doesn't have to be council tax. It can just be normal day to day stuff. Get writing notices. Don't put up with it. I mean, I've done it for little things on eBay, for example. You know, uh, I've had um, companies try charging me way over the top for postage and say, no, 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 your postage was nine quid or something. It was not 29. You add in 20 quid to it. So then I would serve notice on them and say, well, no, you know, and then they would back off and go, okay, it's nine quid. It, it depends. But yeah, and we've got loads. We have a um, workshop now where we are in Leicester and we have workshops all over the land now and we have a lot of wins now. Um, we're getting rid of parking tickets very quickly. In fact, we just had one. Um, um, someone, um, you know who you are if you're watching. I won't mention your name, though. But um, she managed to get rid of a parking ticket with one notice. Done. Brutal. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, um, all sorts of stuff. Uh, we've had people dealing with um, um, retirement homes. You remember the, the, the lockdown nonsense and... Um, People weren't allowed to see their relatives. In, 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 well, a lady wanted to do, um, I believe it's called FaceTime or something. I'm not too sure. On the, with uh, one of the uh, old old people living in there, I think it was. And the retirement home den denied. So the lady went, really? Okay. Notice, if you don't do as I am telling you, I am suing you for 10 grand. And anyway, the retirement home relented and said, oh, okay, then she got a FaceTime. So it's stuff like this, you know, it works if you stand your ground. Don't use emails, people. Don't use websites. Don't use texts. Texts are hearsay. You know, they're not legally binding contracts in any way, shape, or form. Don't do any of that. Put it in the writing, okay, A4, type it out, sign it, get it witnessed if you wish, depending on the situation, put it through Royal Mail Office. Do it professionally because what you are doing, you are creating your case. That's what a case is. The case is where you put your paperwork in. When you go to court and open your case, there's my paperwork. The, the person with the best paperwork wins. If you've got the best paperwork, you can file it with the courts because it's all commerce-based, you will win. Depends who you're going up against, though. You can't use the system to go after the system, by the way. That's different. But if you are going after a company or a corporation or something like that, as long as your paperwork is solid, you've got a very good, strong uh, chance of winning. But you've got to just learn this stuff. Pete, where can people get hold of you, find out about the Sovereign Project? Can you expand a bit upon that? 
Sure. Yes. Um, I set up a um, website called the Sovereign Project dot live. OK, um, I set this up a couple of years ago. Um, basically, it was after the mandate stuff because everyone was panicking over mandates. And I was going, look, don't you understand how mandates work? You can't be mandated without a contract. So um, anyway, so I, I set this website up so people could download free information. So on the website, there is free documents you can download so if you want to know how to do a notice there's a document that explains how to do it if you want to know about affidavits there's a document on there that explains it if you want to know how courts are supposed to work or warrants how they're supposed to work all this sort of stuff it's all on there and it's in easy to read english it's all for free you can download it we also hold and um, there's there's loads i don't do this on my own anymore i have a big team now okay in fact, last time we checked, I think we've got over 12,000 members in 75 countries. So we are expanding. And uh, so we hold free workshops upon the land. So um, if you want to go on the website, see if there is a workshop local to you. You are free you free to attend, um, introduce yourself. And we go through this every week, bit by bit. You know, we'll do signatures one week and notices another and all this sort of stuff. That's free. We're also um, putting together an online course because we've got so many people in other countries and they're saying, oh, we want to learn this, but can you do it online? So we've put together an online course. There's details of that on the website as well. We've even put it in a manual now because people were contacting us and saying, look, there's a lot of documents. They don't really want to download it all and staple it and print it all out. Can you just print us a book? All right, then we've done that. So if you want it in a manual, there's a manual on there um there's a lot more going on with the sovereign project okay i've got a lot of people i'm working with a lot of different groups and i've got some good specialists involved now so if you want to get involved with the sovereign project there is an email on there for collaboration so if you want to work with us um, get in contact what we're also doing is we're trying to put together a business directory all right these are businesses that want out of the system they are sick and tired of all the regulations and all the licensing and the, all the rest of it okay so we're going to put together a business directory when there's enough businesses involved we will be able to help you with the tools to protect your business like pmas and cooperatives and trusts and all that sort of stuff and alternatives to the fiat currency system you really do not want to be using fiat currency and you don't want nothing to do with the central bank digital currency either. Um, we have a, a, a crypto specialist now. So if you want to get into cryptos, we've got someone there who can help you. We've got an ex-police officer. He's also ex-military. And if you are ex-police or ex-military yourself and you want to connect with us and work with us, please get in contact. And um, we've got quite a few joining now. Um, we've got a trust specialist. Um, so we've got two actually. So if you want to trust setting up, We've got someone who can do that for you. There's details of workshops and chess clubs. Chess clubs is more for, um, that's code, chess club. You have to figure that out. But um, chess club is really for people who've done the workshop a few times. So you understand how it works. And now they want to tackle the big remedies. And that's what we're working on. But the problem is, is there is a solution to everything. But to understand the remedy, you have to understand how the system works. So, that's the problem. There's this gap of knowledge that people don't understand. So it's like DVLA. I can say, yeah, you can uh, take your card back by collapsing the trust. And people go, well, what does that mean? I said, well, you can take back the, the bond and accept for value. People, oh, What does that mean? That is for people who are higher up. Okay. At the minute, the Sovereign Project is working on the lay person. We're just getting someone who doesn't know anything and uh, just panicking. They don't know where to turn. There's so many scams on the internet, by the way. All right. So what we do is we give you the basic tools so you can then move to the next level. And then you can then spot the scams yourself. All right. Um, we have social media, which is Facebook, Telegram, Instagram, Gab, MeWe, and Odyssey. So you can get um, in contact through that. Um, but yeah, anyone who wants to get involved. Another thing we are looking for is um, we've got another project in the on the go, which is called, I can't really talk much about it, but it's called Operation Shepherd. I <laughs> can't go into more detail than that. Um, but we are putting together some marketing material. And one of the things we're trying to do is get T-shirts done. Um, a lot of people are asking for T-shirts, but we don't technically have anyone who can design T-shirts for us. So we'd like to do it and we'd like to put slogans on the T-shirt like, where's the contract? You know, so when the, you know, you get a council tax bill, well, hang on a minute, where's the contract? You know, parking ticket, where's the contract? Speeding ticket, where's the contract? You know, all of it, income tax, where's the contract? You know, so 
if you in, if you can design t-shirts get in contact you can help us so we want some good designs some good images and all the rest of it and we're going to start getting that out there as well get people talking um oh by the way I, I do have a couple of books like i say i've got a book called the system i have to promote my books everyone's telling me off to say you don't tell people about your book so i'm going to tell you uh system by a thousand cuts sorry system the system death by a thousand cuts and also the uh, sovereign manual that is copyright free so even if you buy a copy of the sovereign manual you are free to copy it you, it's done in a binder so you can open it you can use your scanner and then you can share it on social media. No problem at all. You could do that. It's copyright free. I don't care. In fact, all the information on the website is free and it's copyright free. You can have it. It's free and you can share it. I don't even care if you put your own name to it. It's yours. Have it. <laughs> but I can't tell you what to do. And I'm not responsible for the information. People have got to do their own due diligence. All right. You take the information. You go and check it out. And if you want to use it, use it. If you don't, you don't. That's why it's called the Sovereign Project. There's the clue in the title. <laughs> Pete, listen, mate, you've been absolutely brilliant. It's Cheers, fascinating bro. stuff. It really does make you realise that we're all just we're just a, a little kilter away from living a completely different existence, aren't we? You know, from yes. from these maniacs. Perhaps next time when you come on the show, we can maybe chat about the birth certificate. Oh, yeah identity it's another one where let's not get into it now but you mm. know i think people would be fascinated to learn that they're they're floated on the stock market yes <laughs> and they're worth <laughs> a fortune um <laughs> but yes brother listen stay on the line so i can thank you properly but sure. um just just to say massive thank you for everything you're doing you know, you got to stand up for the kids pete haven't you oh it, god it, yeah we didn't even just, touch that but yeah we'll get into you know, that next you, time. You've, you've just got to Yes. Um, so I hope I'm doing my bit by by hosting this show and you're certainly doing yours. So let's chat again soon to everybody out there. We'll put all Pete's links below. So please get involved. Start to learn about what what your rights really are. If you can like and subscribe, click the notification bell. That will be wonderful. If you can support us on Patreon, folks, or become a YouTube member or get over to our locals channel where we talk uh, about stuff without the the censorship. That would be really great. And uh, much love. <laughs>